Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh, neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former trainees. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question into the Q&A chat box. And we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you missed, if you've had any uh, have any questions after today's event, or if you're watching the recorded version and have questions or comments, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary department researchers, assistant professor and director of the Brain Tumor Biology and Therapy Lab, Dr. Samir Agnihotri. Thank you for being here with us today, Dr. Agnihotri. And as for that, Dr. Friedlander, thank you and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin, and I uh, look forward to Dr. Agnihotri's uh, presentation uh, today. As I usually do, I'd like to provide a, a brief update uh, of uh, the week. Uh, last time I told you that uh, we we're looking forward to our resident uh, graduation, um, which uh, we did uh, this past uh, Saturday. It was a wonderful uh, event. It was nice to be able to get uh, together and get uh, a little closer towards uh, um, normalcy in, in our life and, and things uh, to celebrate. Certainly everybody appreciate it as a highlight of uh, the year. We get to, uh, to uh, see the uh, residents uh, and the great uh, roast and speeches, and uh, we get uh, to see our graduating residents' uh, parents, and it's so nice uh, to see them. They have so much to be proud of. Obviously, going through a medical career and this neurosurgical training uh, really takes a village. It's not just the person that's uh, doing it that uh, uh, requires uh, a lot of uh, time and, uh, and dedication to it, but really it's a family and it's so wonderful to meet them and, and see them. This year uh, we uh, we needed to do a graduation outside and we did it at the zoo. Uh, we may be uh, uh, revisiting uh, that. Uh, we're lucky that uh, um, this uh, uh, the graduation happened on uh, Saturday here and that on Sunday we had a uh, for those who live in Pittsburgh, uh, we had a, a, a fairly uh, massive uh, storm with hail and trees coming down. So I'm glad that uh, we had it Saturday. So obviously, it was somebody was watching for us. So that was a uh, uh, terrific, uh, uh, brief uh, COVID uh, update. Uh, as you know, the numbers are remain uh, very low in Western Pennsylvania and within our hospitals. Important to uh, continue to take uh, precautions. But as always, uh, we've seen uh, people that. Uh, delay care for fear to come into the hospital, please contact uh, your practitioners in the Department of Neurosurgery. We're doing a quite a bit of a telemedicine so people don't even have to come uh, uh, to the hospital for, for the visit. So again, I urge everybody to uh, uh, continue to, to approach us as, uh, as uh, you have uh, thus far. I'm delighted uh, to introduce once again, Dr. Samir Agnihotri, really one of our superstar uh, brain tumor researchers within our department. We have an incredibly uh, robust uh, team of, uh, of uh, scientists and clinicians that work and research on brain tumors. Dr. Agni Hotri came to us uh, a few years ago from a terrific uh, group in uh, Toronto and is doing some fantastic uh, work. I'm so proud that he's uh, part of our uh, department and uh, I really am looking forward to his uh, presentation and discussion. So, Dr. Agni Hotri, thank you for joining us and please take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Friedlander, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's truly humbling to be on again and uh, present about um, our general consensus as to what the molecular landscape of brain tumors are today. And what's more exciting, um, because of all this new diagnoses, we're now coming into an age of actually finding new treatments. So hope is uh, beyond the horizon. And so for the next few minutes, I just want to catch everybody up to speed um, in terms of what we study as a group, truly as an integrated team over here at UPMC and Children's Hospital and University of Pittsburgh. But we know in, in normal cells, <clears throat> they divide. And if there is some type of damage, the cells have these systems in check to stop them from growing. And uh, brain cancer or cancers in general, 
um, they somehow evade these normal processes. So they can accumulate these type of mutations. And what happens is you have this stereotypical uncontrolled growth, uh, resistance to treatment. And much like uh, a cookbook, our DNA encodes for several recipes, which are typically considered genes. And then they code for proteins or amino acids, which are kind of like the ingredients of a cake. So you can imagine now uh, we are finding out with all our molecular biology that mutations in the cookbook can lead to bad recipes and bad systems. So we're now appreciating in today's age that cancer of an organ is not a single disease anymore. So when you hear the term brain cancer, brain tumor, we can now appreciate that um, there's different substructures of the brain, a fantastic and very interesting organ. And we're different anatomy parts are, you can have different types of tumors. So for example, in the pons and medulla, you can get medulloblastoma or pontine gliomas, you can get glioblastoma in the forebrain or different locations, you can get meningiomas on the meninges. So we're now understanding that brain tumors are highly diverse. Just to add a little bit more nuance and complexity, we now know that cancer of a cell type or substructure is not even a single disease. And we've done some fantastic work with some of our amazing collaborators around the field led by Michael Taylor and several other groups, that the cerebellum, that part of the brain that helps you <clears throat> walk and play really good at video games, or be really good at video games, uh, it can now comprise of different molecular subgroups. So medulloblastoma has several subgroups that we'll talk about a little later, but each of these subgroups then have different uh, diagnoses and different uh, clinical outcomes. And now what we're gonna be talking about is cancer of a single patient is not even a single disease. So again, with all these new molecular tests that are coming out, we're really understanding how diverse and how complex these brain tumors truly are. So here you would say, okay, now we have a patient with a brain tumor. We would just think of it as one individual tumor type. But when you look at the cellular level, individual cells, you look at the genomics and even epigenomes, which we'll be talking about later, you can, we are now appreciating that not every tumor cell within a patient behaves the same. And therefore, we are gonna need multiple treatments and multiple therapies to target this. And to highlight the genome and epigenome, epigenome is just a way of organizing the genome. Um, the best way I can describe it is, here you have a caterpillar that turns into a butterfly. They have the identical genome, but the epigenetic or epigenome allows certain proteins and genes to turn on and off. And you get this wonderful metamorphogenesis. So based on these facts, why would one treatment work? And how does one accurately diagnose tumors uh, with such heterogeneity? And the, the goal of our lab and the goal of the program truly uh, is to you know, really bring in personalized medicine you know, to the point where we can now identify what type of brain tumor entity is, what type of molecular profiling could add in terms of the heterogeneity, basically what types of treatments could work. And now we can stratify patients into meaningful groups and then hopefully a appropriate treatment. Also, this will let us figure out some brain tumor patients and entities that just have no current standard of care or effective treatment currently. So that can help us in the bench. So the challenges of diagnosis. Uh, so there's a lot of heterogeneity and there are a lot of issues when it comes to tumor types. So molecular testing has really helped us uh, classify brain tumors and hopefully today I'll go over several of these entities. But sometimes even under the microscope, histologically, these tumors look identical, but one is very fa fatal. This is an ependymoma to the left and to the right, another type of ependymoma, which is essentially non-lethal and cured with surgery. But you still can't just tell under the microscope. So what's, re what's been a remarkable um, progress from bench to bedside, and this is truly fascinating in, in my career, and Dr. Friedland will highlight some of this perhaps after the talk, but in the early days of molecular testing, everything was just done on patient samples and we were getting a lot of information, but over the last couple of years, we're now taking these molecular tests and uh, data sets that we've been building in the labs and now actually using them for clinical purposes with the hopes of using these profiles and these diagnostics and these wonderful tools uh, to now stratify patients into meaningful trials. And some of these uh, molecular tests that we're actively running uh, in the lab, also in, in the cl uh, clinic, are genomics that we'll be talking about, epigenomes, uh, proteomics, metabolomics. So what's really exciting is we've just scratched the surface of all these new molecular tests and how to stratify and um, 
subgroup brain tumors. So one type of test that's been uh, really striking lately are methylation uh, reports and methylation data. So again, how the DNA is organized in the cell. Every brain tumor leaves a fingerprint or a identity that we can then sequence and then identify what type of brain tumor that is. And this classification can allow us to figure out uh, treatment options. So here's an example of this methyl methylation report, and this is a glioblastoma. And this glioblastoma patient has uh, the MGMT promoter um, unmethylated. So again, the take-home message here is this patient most likely may not respond to a conventional treatment for glioblastoma known as temozolomide. So this patient might be enrolled in a, another experimental trial. Additionally, what methylation assays or tools uh, can be used for is to look at copy number or the DNA cookbook analogy that I was talking about. And here, anything that's around zero is not altered. Anything you see elevated over here means that the tumor cells might have more of it, and anything that's down here means tumor cells have less of it. And from this report, you can see that EGFR, which is a very important protein in glioblastoma that drives this uh, very nasty fatal uh, glioma, uh, it is amplified here, and perhaps this patient could receive an EGFR inhibitor. <clears throat> so with that, I'd like to go over um, some several brain tumor entities uh, that our lab has worked on in the past, currently working on, and some of our collaborators, and try to catch everybody up to speed as to the current state, uh, which is ever evolving, but at least we can appreciate how some of these um, molecular tests are giving us a better hope and so I'd like to go through uh, several examples of where we're at and where we're at with treatment options. So meningiomas are, uh, you know, commonly arise from the coverings of the brain. These are the meninges. Uh, one of the most common alterations that have been uh, implicated in meningiomas is the loss of a protein known as NF2 or the chromosome where NF2 is, which is 22Q. They can occur in different parts of the brain. And here is uh, molecular uh, testing. Uh, this is a hier hierarchical clustering uh, of several thousand meningiomas, but the take home message is you can see uh, patterns starting to emerge where this group of patients looks slightly different than this group of patients, which looks slightly different than this group of patients. And what that typically now means is once we start to see these patterns, as you can see over here, we can now layer in uh, anatomy, we can layer in sex of the patient, uh, tumor location, and also survival. So this is very informative. So right now, currently, there's uh, considered six subgroups uh, at the <clears throat> molecular level from an ingioma. Uh, three of them are, four of them are predominantly driven through NF2, that tumor suppressor that I'll briefly describe in the next slide. And there's a few groups of meningioma that don't have the traditional NF2 mutations. So you can see right here, when we look at location, they're in different parts of the brain. The ratio of male to female can change based on the subgroup and also some of the survival things. So NF2 is a tumor suppressor gene. And basically what that means, it acts as like a break. It tells the cells to you know, grow at a reasonable level. And when it is missing, uh, it's also known as a Merlin, it leads to cell growth. So this is one of a, a hallmark study that uh, was done by Marat Gunnell's group. And essentially, based on the molecular subtyping of meningiomas, we can now start to stratify patients on some clinical trials that are going on. So for example, bismotigib, if NF1 patients have a mutation in this gene called smoothin, uh, they may respond to bismotigib. If there's mutations in PA3 kinase pathway, they're now be given uh, PA3 kinase inhibitors and some ongoing results. Uh, hopefully, you can see how these trials are going. But NF2 mutant meningioma patients are now receiving some back inhibitors. There seems to be some uh, efficacy in this group. <clears throat> so the take-home message here for meningiomas, as the other brain tumors will delve into, is if we can identify the fingerprint or that molecular subgroup, we can perhaps stratify patients into the appropriate trial. So now we're gonna just talk a little bit about other types of brain tumors, uh, pediatric low-grade gliomas. Uh, one thing over here that's really striking is polycytic astrocytomas. Um, they typically have a survival that is 90% or greater 10 years from diagnosis. However, there are some subgroups of pediatric low-grade patients that do not respond well to treatment. They can occur in different parts of the body as well, whether it's optic pathways, uh, the midline of the brain. So with all our work, uh, this has been pioneered by Dr. Pollock over here at UPMC. 
Um, we've now studied that pilocytic astrocytomas, uh, gangliomas, and uh, PXAs for short, pleomorphic xanthroastrocytomas, typically have a mutation in a gene known as BRAF. It can be fused to another gene called KIA1549, which I'll show in a subsequent slide. And also, it can have a point mutation where the amino acid goes from barely to 600. So in a, in a nutshell, we're now seeing that pilocytic astrocytomas occur in various anatomical regions. The mutation itself it can be highlighted uh, in different places. For example, PXAs typically are defined by BRAF E600E, -E, and they occur here. So with pilocytic astrocytomas, what's really exciting is this pathway, the RAS pathway, is highly targetable. And there's some amazing clinical trials that are going on here at our hospital and with other international and uh, national consortium. So in a nutshell, what we see here is we have growth factor signaling. This is a receptor. Our body is in our serum and our CSF. We have a lot of growth factors that activate this receptor. It's basically a series of commands that tells the cell to go. So you see an activation event. This protein then talks to this protein, and we have a downwards event that basically leads to cell growth. In these low-grade gliomas, we predominantly see this fusion in BRAF, which leads to this pathway being uncontrollable and highly active. You can also see loss of NF1 and PTPN, uh, which is another phosphatase, and essentially the brakes are being cut, the pathway is being hyperactive. So what does that mean in terms of treatments? Uh, well, we know that there's several clinical trials that are coming on, but what's really exciting, there are MEK inhibitors and BERK inhibitors. So right here, activation of MEK through BRAF mutations is a druggable target. Uh, we now have treatments that uh, can selectively target MEK. We have MEK inhibitors that are blood-brain barrier penetrant. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Friedlander will highlight the problem in neurosurgery and in brain tumor biology in general is sometimes we can even get the right drug, but it just doesn't want to cross that blood-brain barrier. So here is a nice case where we can actually have therapies that are actually effective at getting into the brain, and that's a major hurdle that we face in our field. Now we're going to talk a little bit about pediatric high-grade gliomas before we get into adult high-grade gliomas. Pediatric high-grade gliomas are uh, a little distinct from their adult counterparts. So again, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we treated them the same as adults, but now we're appreciating that pediatric high-grade gliomas are uh, somewhat uh, distinct from their adult counterparts. They can be defined by uh, different types of mutations. I've highlighted two here. Uh, one is a histone mutation, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and another is a different kind of histone mutation. What's really interesting is in the genomic era, we're, we're merging good old anatomy with mutations in genomics. So for example, uh, these DIPGs or these uh, brain tumors that grow in the ponds or in the midline, they always have this molecular signature of K27M. And we'll be talking slightly about that and what it does. But these type of tumors don't grow anywhere else in the brain. And from a biological perspective, that's really interesting because that lets us know that there's something special about this part of the brain that allows these tumors to form and there's something special about the forebrain that allows these G34 tumors to grow. We're not sure if that's going to convert into a treatment option yet, but it is uh, very striking in the differences between these two groups. So essentially what happens is in the pediatric realm, these histomutant tumors, uh, they are predominantly seen in younger children. Uh, they lead to a hypomethylation uh, phenotype, which is an epigenetic alteration that can be targeted. High-grade gliomas can also have that BRAF mutation that we see in low grades, so that's a targetable uh, uh, mutation that can be targeted. And IDH, which I'll be talking about later. And then we also have another group of high-grade gliomas that have different kinds of molecular alterations, PDGFRA, MICN, or EGFR, and we're excited because there's a lot of next-generation treatments that are entering uh, phase one, phase two clinical trials to target these. So when we talk about DIPG and pediatric high-grade gliomas, some of those molecular alterations, such as EGFR, are being uh, are in clinical trials. So hopefully, uh, the next time I present, we will have some more encouraging data. Uh, so this is really exciting because even a couple of years ago, we were really good at diagnosing and figuring out what type of brain tumor you had, 
And now what we're seeing, uh, which is emerging uh, in, in our department and internationally, which is exciting because this truly is a collaborative effort around the world, uh, patients with certain mutations are now being put into trials to target this. So this is uh, the golden era of uh, molecular biology meets uh, fantastic neurosurgery and neuro-oncology. So now I'd like to talk a little bit of uh, adult gliomas and where we're standing uh, with adult gliomas, because I think this has been uh, a little bit uh, of a mixed bag in, in terms of primary glioblastoma, which are known as wild-type IDH, and secondary low-grade gliomas, which become secondary glioblastoma, are IDH mutant. And I'll be talking about what these mutations do. Unfortunately, uh, IDH wild-type patients, uh, they have one of the worst uh, survival outcomes, but there's some really exciting uh, treatments that are coming around the horizon to really tackle this. IDH mutant patients um, have a different methylation profile. Um, they tend to be lower grade gliomas, but they can progress to higher grade gliomas. So why is this important? Well, based on IDH1, which I'll talk about in the next slide in terms of how it impacts metabolism, um, if you're an IDH wild type, low grade patient, uh, you have a very bad outcome, almost similar to a adult glioblastoma patient. And if you are a low grade glioma patient, with 1P19Q co-deletion, this molecular signature from our testing, you tend to have a better survival. So this is informative because now we can stratify patients into their prognosis group. So we know immediately patients in the orange and the red group are gonna be uh, rushed into some uh, cutting edge uh, novel treatments. Patients in these groups may respond to different treatment or we might even de-escalate therapies in some cases. Right, so what does IDH1 actually do? IDH1 mutation is interesting because it produces this unique metabolite. So if you remember biochemistry, enzymes work on uh, intermediates or, or nutrients and they generate uh, secondary metabolites. 2-hydroxyglutarate is something that is not naturally produced in our body or 2-HG. And what 2-HG does, it competes with a naturally occurring metabolite in our body, alpha-ketoglutarate. And this is very, very important for uh, our cells to normally function. This is very important for uh, mitochondria function, the powerhouse of the cell. And mutant IDH, when this mutation occurs, which we can detect by sequencing, it makes this novel metabolite that shouldn't be there. And it basically interferes with day-to-day -day cell functioning. Um, so we've known this now for about 15 years, I think, or it's been a while. I was still in grad school when the discovery was made. And What's been remarkable in my career, and I think Dr. Freeland will talk about that uh, after, is we now have several ways of targeting this drug in low-grade glio glioma patients and even secondary glioblastoma patients. So there's IDH1 inhibitors such as AG120, which selectively block and target the mutant and not the wild type. We believe that this should restore normal function and selectively target uh, tumor cells. So we'll see how the clinical trials uh, will emerge in subsequent years. In addition, there was a paper that just recently came out about immunotherapies. And what's really exciting, and uh, this has been done over here by Dr. Monkler, Dr. Frank Lieberman, Cohen Bosch, and Dr. Pollack, um, <clears throat> with respect to different cancers. And this was a wonderful study done by Wolfgang Wick and Michael Platten, where patients with this IDH mutation are receiving a peptide vaccine that targets the tumor cells. So in summary, when it comes to mutations that are actionable, the hypothesis or the theory is if we can selectively target the mutation, we should be able to leave normal cells. And if we can empower the immune system to recognize a mutation, it can selectively target cancer cells. So as I said, a lot of trials have uh, not been super successful in adult glioblastoma, uh, but now we're finding out with all this molecular knowledge uh, and with the immunotherapy emergence that's coming out that there's different ways to perhaps tackle this disease, the so-called thinking outside the box. And again, it's been an honor to be a part of this department because UPMC has really been at the forefront at some of these clinical trials that are really trying to target um, uh, glioblastoma patients using immunotherapy. So for example, EGFR V3, remember this growth factor receptor, if you look at your old blood reports, you'll see EGF levels usually. Um, this receptor is usually mutated or super active in uh, glioblastoma, which leads to increased cell growth. Uh, there's a lot of clinical trials that are using T cells uh, to recognize V3 and target them. Uh, 
uh, over here at UPMC, there's several clinical trials around the world as well uh, with anti-PD-1 inhibitors, which are trying to block uh, the tumor cell from inhibiting immune cells. And these therapies combined basically re-empower the immune system to now target and kill uh, glioblastoma cells. Now, I know you guys must be exhausted from all this virus talk for the last year and a half about COVID, but uh, viruses are not all bad. Um, Oncolytic viral therapies, where viruses uh, are uh, basically engineered to specifically recognize tumor cells, are have been shown to work high, uh, have been shown to be effective in glioblastoma. So they can target uh, glioblastoma cells and not normal cells. And basically, viruses are now uh, capable of uh, replicating and selectively killing glioblastoma cells and not normal brains. So in addition to immunotherapy. Uh, something I mentioned earlier is remember that heterogeneity or that not every cell is the same. So these treatments may be effective. Um, and in combination, there's several clinical trials that are emerging to target some of those additional molecular alterations that we were talking about. For example, PD-1 with respect to immunotherapy. PARP activation has been seen in a lot of glioblastoma. So there's a lot of next generation therapies and drugs that are targeting PARP. EGFR, that one receptor I was talking about, there's new drugs coming out. So there's several trials that are going to be completed and started. So it, it truly is an interesting and exciting time uh, as a researcher uh, to figure out how to, to translate some of these molecular findings. <clears throat> so in the, in the last, um, say, 10 minutes or so, I'd like to talk about some of the other uh, brain tumors uh, that we study in the lab and um, also at the Institute. So ependymomas, these tumors uh, affect both children and adults. Um, they're thought to derive from neural stem cells. So neural stem cells are those special cells that help generate the brain, uh, radioveals that are normally mature into ependymal cells. And these ependymal cells line the ventricles. So these are those fluid filled spaces in the brain. Now, what's interesting is the term ependymoma, when you do the molecular testing and we do all the sequencing and methylation assays, we can actually identify nine subgroups. It's interesting that such a rare brain tumor, ependymoma, is actually stratified into nine groups. And so what does that mean? Well, if we look at ependymomas in the forebrain or in the supertentorial region, the one that is the most deadly is the rel fusion. If we look into the posterior fossa ependymoma, the ones that are most lethal are the PFA group or PFEPMA group. We have an amazing, amazing uh, faculty recruit that will be starting here uh, later this year, who is this, uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Michael Raj, who will be pursuing some of the ependymoma research. So this will be really exciting to get this program going. So the REL-A mutation, what that does is it activates uh, this REL-B nucleus <clears throat> or REL-A signaling events. And what is interesting is this has been shown to be active in several other cancers. So there's a there's a plethora of drugs and therapies that could be used uh, in clinic now. And this is something that we've been lacking in. One of the most lethal brain tumors, uh, it's an infant brain tumor, the PFA subgroup, um, it doesn't have any clear genetic driver. So this is one of those cases where we just don't know. We know it's highly lethal. It's it recurs. It's very nasty, um, um, akin to adult glioblastoma, and we just don't know what's really truly driving it. And <clears throat> this is a study that was an international collaboration done by Michael Taylor's group with Dr. Michael Raj now joining our faculty. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and what we did and what he really did was to highlight um, essentially that these uh, infant PFA tumors have altered methylation and uh, its metabolism or how a cell eats sugars and different nutrients can impact it. Why is this important? Well, again, remember that genomic code has to be organized in some way, shape or form to be truly read. And at the same time, epigenetics over the last 20 to 30 years has been emerging as a leading uh, therapy candidate class. So there's a there's a whole slew of drugs that are entering uh, clinical trials for both adult and pediatric brain tumors, and this raises uh, an exciting time for trialists to start trying some of these new therapies. This is information that we just didn't have uh, years ago. So this is again uh, a nice way of so showing that you know we now know brain tumors have uh, different groups. There's about 98 brain tumors, uh, 120 uh, based on just. Diagnostic tests such as methylation 
And now we can start to see these patterns. And as we get better at this, we can start to identify more meaningful therapies. And metabolism, again, if we remember from our high school biology, uh, we know that normal cells in the brain, uh, as most resting cells, you know, they like to take glucose. Glucose enters uh, Dr. Friedlander's favorite organelle, the mitochondria, and it generates 36 ATP. And ATP is the currency of a cell that ATP can then be lysed to generate free energy to basically keep us uh, alive. And tumor cells and cancer cells basically uh, co-opt or hijack this pathway not to generate ATP as much, but all these intermediates of metabolism can be used to generate mass. So for example, glucose is a backbone of nucleotides, so tumor cells need more of that. Lactate can then be secreted, this acidic metabolite, into the environment. Lactate has been shown to be immunosuppressive itself and can have negative consequences on, on brain function as well when in excess. And if you can rewire the mitochondria, you can regenerate certain types of fats and proteins. So if we zoom in a little bit on that, uh, it, what our lab is doing um, is essentially um, very specific enzymes and metabolism can be targeted. For example, 2-deoxyglucose is in clinical trials right now. Um, DCA dichloroacetate has been shown to inhibit some of these enzymes that are important in glycolysis. Asparaginase, these are enzymes uh, that can take away some of those amino acids. And again, just highlighting IDH as we talked about, which is also important for lipid synthesis. Interestingly, we're also trying to investigate if diet can also modulate some of these pathways of metabolism. So the last set of brain tumors I just want to quickly touch upon are chordomas. Um, again, these are a rare cancer, but they occur into the bone and the skull base. And we're now working with uh, Dr. Andy Van Tyker and Dr. Paul Garner over here at UPMC. And we're trying to see if we can adopt similar approaches uh, as highlighted by some of the other uh, brain tumor entities to uh, stratify them molecularly and identify novel uh, drugs. So CDK inhibitors, which make a cell grow, may show efficacy. T brachyuri, which is a defining genetic alteration of chromosomes, uh, that's interesting to target via perhaps uh, immunotherapy such as T cells or small molecule inhibitors. And lastly, I'd like to just talk about medulloblastoma. Uh, medulloblastoma really, it's very interesting how some of these rare brain tumors uh, have spearheaded the molecular era for not just more common brain tumors, but a lot of other cancers. Uh, and this is just an example to show you why uh, international collaborative work uh, is very important to overcoming this disease. And it's an honor to be here uh, to, to work in a, a group where we have so many amazing scientists and clinicians that really, uh, the power really is in numbers. And so medulloblastoma, um, these are more pediatric brain tumors, but we're noticing the heterogeneity in that case. So <clears throat> they're now stratified into several subgroups, uh, again, based on uh, the molecular testing and mutations and methylation. And we can see that the Wnt subgroup, those patients typically do better and patients in the group three and group four uh, tend to do worse, especially uh, group three. And we now know that the group three medulloblastomas have a distinct signature where they're uh, overexpressing really nasty uh, proteins such as MYC, which basically keeps cells highly uh, metabolic and also in an active group, uh, active growing state, and also resistant to conventional treatments such as uh, chemotherapies and uh, radiation. So now clinical trials are going to be trying to focus on how to target MYC, <clears throat> and as you can see, CDK inhibitors perhaps for some group four patients. So hopefully in summary, I've, I've given you a, a very brief, but a, a nice global view of how we've moved from just taking uh, tumor samples from patients and, and taking molecular testing, but how this is now informing us uh, into identifying better treatments. Um, and also as we identify better treatments, uh, enrolling patients in better clinical trials and truly being smarter about this. And hopefully for some of those tumor entities that we don't have current therapies, uh, we're, we're now learning uh, from our bench to bedside and bedside to bench uh, how to perhaps develop and devise new uh, treatment options. So with that, I'd really like to thank my lab that have been instrumental in some of the molecular testing and some of the drug work that we were talking about. Uh, on the pediatric side, uh, Dr. Pollock, Bally Hu, Gary Kovash have been amazing for uh, the immunotherapies and targeted therapies. 
on the adult side, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Moncler, Dr. Gardner for the glioma work and the um, Perdomo work. Dr. Friedlander has been amazing because we can talk about mitochondria all day and metabolism, which is really exciting. Dr. Jeremy Rich, uh, another expert and colleague that talks about glioblastoma or clinical trialists at the adult and pediatric level. Uh, Dr. Frank Lieberman, Ben Mantika, Linda McAllister, and Dr. Ramasher. I'd also like to thank several other members of my lab that just joined our various funding uh, sources. And with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Agnew uh, What an incredible presentation. We're very lucky to have you with us here in Pittsburgh. Uh, we're going to begin the Q&A portion of our presentation. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can in our allotted time. Uh, Dr. Friedlander, would you like to make a few comments or have questions before we begin? Sure, thank you very much. And some really a fantastic uh, presentation summarizing so much data from the literature as well as importantly that your, your lab itself has uh, generating, uh, generated and pushing forward is really, um, it feels like we're in the middle of something. I remember when I started uh, doing uh, neurosurgery and I don't want to think of how many years ago, now, you know, we would, as you mentioned, we would look at a slide on the microscope and and give something a diagnosis and uh, and then throw some therapy, which uh, you know, for a lot of the tumors uh, didn't really work uh, very well. And I, I feel like it, we've been in a transition now where over the past two decades or so, we're really trying to really provide a ID, a fingerprint of, uh, of the tumor rather than just uh, some uh, global um, um, uh, descriptions uh, of them. Tell me, what, what are your thoughts when, when we look at, you know, obviously glioblastoma multiforme, just by its name, it's got so many changes and so many differences, but because of something has changed either on the genome or on the epigenome, as you described, doesn't mean that it's driving the process. So how, what strategy do you take to figure out a marker of something that, that really is that meaningful from a therapeutic point of view versus something that's really mechanistically driving the, the, the tumor itself? Thank you, Dr. Freeland. That, that is one of the most complex and, and challenging questions. Um, one of the, the problems of molecular testing, as you can appreciate, is we, we run these tests and we see things that pop up uh, that could be clinically actionable, for example, uh, EGFR. But glioblastoma is... It is a, a challenge in, in the sense that not every cell will have the target. So we need to now factor, for example, if only 10% of the cells actually have the target and finally the techniques are getting good enough to resolve that, is it still meaningful to enroll that patient on a therapy that targets that, uh, number one? And number two, this, this raises another question that we've talked about in the past. Do we now need to use multiple testing techniques to identify multiple targets and develop clinical trials that for glioblastoma would target, let's say, EGFR or another target known as PDGFR. Uh, so some of the data that's come out of our lab and, and other labs has shown clearly that one therapy is not enough. The tumor cells adapt on the fly and identifying mechanisms of resistance or combinations that work uh, are going to be very important. Thank you. How about, um, obviously with uh, lung cancer as an example, you smoke, you're at higher risk of getting lung cancer or you're exposed to the sun, you get more higher risk of that, having a, a melanoma as, as examples. You know, with, with the brain tumors in general, do you think there's anything in the environment, in the microbiome, something that's not genetically encoded that really increases or um, not necessarily decreases, but increases the risk of uh, developing a tumor. That's, that's again, a very uh, perplexing um, thing that we faced, and I'm sure you have it's in the past. On the adult side, there is some literature and some evidence to suggest viral exposure. Again, the data is a little wishy-washy if that's true or not. Uh, when it comes to the environment and what you're talking about, the, the best example of brain tumors where the environment may have a significant role is actually in pediatric, i.e. the infant uh, brain tumors. So something that's happening in utero where mom might be exposed to some chemical agent or mutagen, which could trigger a brain tumor. 
Uh, again, there's uh, studies in mice that have shown that this could happen, but there is no concrete connection. But from most of the scientists and clinicians in the field, no one's ruled that out at, at all. Uh, in fact, the ependymoma example, what I was bringing up, where you don't see a clear cut genetic driver, that would imply uh, that your hypothesis would be correct in that example, that something in, in the environment, whether it's an insult, a hypoxic event, uh, lack of oxygen could trigger some of these developing cells to kind of stick in this non, uh, or in the stem cell life state and they just keep growing and they never get the growth signals to stop growing. Well, as, uh, as you mentioned um, in your talk, I really love our, our collaboration looking at the uh, mitochondria. I, um, you know, I, I study neurodegeneration, so what I want to do is prevent cell death and obviously you study tumors and you want to induce targeted uh, cell death. So really uh, looking at the mitochondria is a, is a, is a very interesting uh, target and uh, I enjoy our collaboration and look forward uh, to uh, seeing the fruits of it in the years uh, uh, to come. So uh, Justin, if uh, there's some uh, questions uh, from the audience, uh, why don't we go ahead with them? Great, thank you, Dr. Freelander. Uh, Dr. Agnihotri, first question here. Um, how does the incidence of PLGA compare to the incidence of other brain tumor types? Oh, that, I, I wouldn't have the, the numbers off the top of my head. Okay, well, next question here. What, what are the most common forms of children's brain tumors? Yeah, so medulloblastoma um, would be one of them for sure. Uh, ependymoma, um, high-grade glioma would be the more, uh, and uh, ATRT, atypical rhabdoid tumors. Um, and then when it comes to low-grade, um, uh, those would be typically the pediatric low-grade gliomas. Great, thank you. Uh, can cognitive damage in pediatric brain tumor patients be reversed? So there is a lot of, uh, this is a field that is actively being funded by the NIH and several other agencies. Uh, we did a study uh, when I was highlighting the meningioma work. Um, radiation induced meningiomas, for example, children that have metroblastomas or high gliomas receive radiation and then and their adults can get what is known as secondary cancer, i.e. a cancer based on the treatment. Uh, they also show cognitive defects, but there's a lot of encouraging work that is coming out. Um, again, uh, I don't want to overstate anything, but there, there seems like there are some ways to uh, work on some of the cognitive defects. And that this is something that has been highlighted over the last uh, several years is highly important. Good, thank you. Um, I hear a lot about tumor grade. What does tumor grade actually mean? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Uh, uh, tumor grade is a way of basically staging uh, or classifying the tumor. So when you hear things like grades one and two, those are typically considered low grade. Uh, they're considered not as uh, proliferative. They're not growing as much. Uh, grades three and four, four being the highest by the WHO, those are typically considered uh, more aggressive, more proliferative, more invasive. Uh, glioblastoma is by the WHO a classification uh, grade four tumor. Um, the DIPG are those brainstem gliomas that I was talking about. Even under a microscope, as Dr. Friedlander was saying, if it looked like a grade one or two or a low grade, by definition, if it now has that histone mutation, K27M, uh, most people are taught to consider that as a grade four. So even histologically, if it looks like a low grade, the molecular would suggest uh, treated as a hybrid because the, those patients typically have a nine to 12 month survival. Very good, thank you. Um, is a benign brain tumor safe? Again, it, that's, a, that's a heavy question. Um, if it's a benign brain tumor or a benign CNS or PNS tumor such as schwannoma, uh, the data suggests, and this is something that I worked on my postdoc, you know, 98% of schwannomas uh, pretty much are considered benign. They're not going to post-surgery, post-radiation, they're pretty much gone. But there's also a, there's a, there's a, a sub percentage of schwannomas or any other benign tumors that do have a molecular fingerprint that would suggest that they're not necessarily benign, they're actually malignant. Um, what we're now finding is when you can take traditional histology, 
and merge the molecular tests when something is called benign, uh, the accuracy and the precision is getting much better. Very good, thank you. Uh, can, a, can a tumor grade change? Yes, yes, and, and a great example of that is when I was showing the slides of IDH. Uh, IDH mutant uh, gliomas or diffuse astrocytomas are typically grade two, uh, and patients with uh, that receive surgery or any type of treatment, uh, when the tumor recurs, uh, typically what will happen is it, it comes back a bit more aggressive. And this is also the case with uh, appendomomas and medulloblastomas. So yes, uh, tumor grade can change. Um, Very good, thank you. Uh, what is a glial cell? That's a, that's a great question. So our brain is comprised of three predominant cells, um, neurons, uh, those are the thinking cells, and neurons are then supported by glial cells. And glial cells basically turn Again, this is a very lay way of describing it, oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. And these glial cells' main function is to feed and support neuronal structure. And these glial cells, uh, <clears throat> as they support neurons, uh, they can also become a source or a potential cell of origin for a brain cancer. So some of these brain tumors that we were describing are of neuronal lineage, such as a, a medulloblastoma, and some of these are of these glial lineage, these support cells of, of the brain, and these would be your glioblastomas. Excellent, thank you. Um, what do you think of the recent paper in Frontiers in nutrition regarding ketogenic metabolic therapy for glioblastoma? You know, this is really exciting. Uh, exciting. I was talked to Dr. Friedlander and several of our collaborators, and this is something that we're actively doing in the lab. Um, there is mounting evidence that um, we know by definition epigenetics and genetics can be influenced by metabolism. And we typically study metabolism uh, at the molecular level. Um, now, ketogenic diets, low methionine diets, other types of diets are being extensively studied in aging research. And again, in um, preliminary studies, it seems like you know, diet could influence or augment or enhance current treatments. So there are actually, there was a trial here uh, looking at ketogenic diets uh, with radiation. Um, it's something that needs more research. It's something that needs more uh, attention to detail, but uh, some of that data looks encouraging and promising. Very good. Thank you, doctor. Um, so we just have one more question here. I think it's a pretty good one to end on here. Uh, what makes studying your brain tumors at the University of Pittsburgh so special for you? That's a great question. Um, that's a, I have a multifaceted answer for that. Number one, uh, honestly, it is the department and my colleagues uh, having Dr. Friedlander, Dr. Pollock, Dr. Kuhlenbosch, Dr. Hu, Dr. Rich that just joined, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Moncler, Dr. Lieber, and I could just name names, Dr. Megan McTika. It's just truly an amazing amount of colleagues that are, it's just the right amount of mass, the right amount of uh, people that are dedicated to brain tumors. The second part is working over here with now being a mentor and having a fantastic lab, some amazing grad students and postdocs in the lab, and just seeing their energy in trying to develop new treatments or trying to understand why some of these tumors are aggressive. It really is uh, the teamwork, the camaraderie, and that old adage that, you know, we, we have to work together to uh, understand this disease. And some of the tools and some of the knowledge and the brain power here and also the technology at UPMC and University of Pittsburgh. It's state of the art. I'm like a kid in a toy store with some of these tools. <laughs> That's wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you, Doc. Thank you again, Dr. Agna Hotri for being with here with us today. What an incre incredible presentation. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees. Again, if you have any questions or would like to learn about ways to the uh, support the Department of Neurosurgery, the work you've just seen, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pit.edu. Uh, we're so happy to be able to stay connected with our Department of Neurosurgery friends like this. Uh, Dr. Freelander, would you like to uh, close us out for the day? Sure, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Nehotri, really fantastic uh, talk. And um, I'm full of uh, excitement in seeing what's going to happen over the next uh, few years uh, to a decade, uh, all these therapies are urgently needed, but we're, it's very clear to me that we're making meaningful 
progress. Some of these uh, horrible uh, tumors, uh, uh, you know, they cause uh, so much uh, human uh, devastation and, and, and to families, and it's uh, uh, frustrating not to be able to do more. But seeing all the work that you're doing and your colleagues are doing uh, really uh, brings uh, renewed uh, hope uh, to this field, as well as obviously there are a lot of other uh, therapies that have uh, demonstrated uh, efficacy and are making a difference. I share your excitement uh, regarding our community here uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, UPMC, and in particular, our Department of uh, Neurosurgery, the nucleus of uh, brain tumor researchers and, and, and surgeons, uh, I think are second uh, to none. And, you know, obviously we have high expectations uh, out of ourselves, uh, but I am uh, really, really excited. So again, thanks for being here and being a member of the faculty and uh, being with us uh, uh, today. Uh, moving uh, forward, uh, uh, we're going to take a little hiatus uh, for a couple of uh, weeks. Uh, please uh, check uh, your emails for uh, the next uh, speakers uh, in July. Have a wonderful uh, couple of weeks. Enjoy the summer and stay safe. Thank you very much. Take care.